be um, to welcome Omar Barr uh, as the discussion of today. Before uh, we say uh, a word about these two speakers, please let me briefly mention a bit the background of the Berm lectures. Uh, so for those who haven't come into contact with Berm yet, Berm is the interdisciplinary center on migration and minorities. So is to help informing a wider audience about the UB is doing uh, in the field of migration and minorities to reach uh, to, to stimulate the public debate on migration and minority issues. Uh, if you're interested, you may follow us on Twitter or on the Berm website. Uh, and Hannah Vermaut uh, is also here on the panel. She's the coordinator of Berm uh, and she will help me today with the moderation tasks. Uh, Hannah, opportunity to say thanks to you formally for helping to uh, lecture today. Uh, so let me briefly introduce you the main actor of today. Uh, so Nick Wogan Williams is a professor of international security in the Department of Politics and National Studies, PIES of the War uh, Warwick Universities. It is known to be, uh, I don't know what is the current standing, but I think the best or one of the very science departments in the United uh, Kingdom. Uh, so it's a very nice place to work at. Uh, Nick is a, is a well-known migration scholar in the UK, Europe and beyond, has an impressive list of publications on issues relating to the politics of borders, migration and security. Earlier books, earlier that, that he's presenting today, uh, are uh, uh, reclaiming migration, Europe's border crisis, everyday security threats. They have been published uh, with really top publishing houses, including Oxford University Press and Manchester University Press. The book, Vernacular Border Security, I don't know if you see it right now, or I'm blurred, but okay, uh, is uh, the result of a Philip Leverhulm Prize and Crank that she held until 2019. Uh, uh, Nick is also the vice provost in related position and chair of the Faculty of Social Sciences at the University of Warwick. It's really a big pleasure having you with us, Nick. Uh, and uh, I think having you is, is kind of related to the wider uh, connection that have built up in recent years between the VUB and the University of Warwick, uh, something that is very much appreciated on the VUB side. Uh, and and uh, it's great that we can build upon these traditions. Uh, so let move to our discussant, Omar Ba, who will be briefly presenting uh, Hannah. Hannah, please. Yes, uh, Omar, welcome. Um, Omar Ba is a project coordinator uh, for the nonprofit organization uh, Bindus, or Bindus, and he works as a diversity and inclusion consultant. He's a very engaged and a critical voice in the debate on equality, uh, migration and inclusive societies. After uh, Professor Vaughan Williams' lecture, um, Omar will reflect and uh, discuss on the lecture and will discuss uh, with the audience. So thank you, Omar, for uh, being here with us uh, and very welcome. Okay, and before giving you the, the floor, Nick, just a few words about the book. So it's a book that has appeared last year. Uh, and Nick is really interested to see how ordinary citizens talk about Europe's so-called migration crisis. It's really fascinating research. I can recommend everybody to read the book. So he puts the, the lens of the vernacular in the center of his, of his research, and he organized focus groups in Germany, Greece, UK, Hungary, and Spain. So he listened to what citizens said, attention to the fact that narratives are much more multifaceted compared to what politicians, pundits often would like us to believe in a way. So he questions whether there's really no alternative to tougher deterrent, border security and politics. Uh, I don't go much deeper than that on the book because I don't want to say anything that you're planning to say. Uh, but thanks again for coming with us. Uh, the floor is yours and we look very much forward uh, to your uh, uh, presentation. Thanks. Thanks very much indeed, um, Florian and, and colleagues. Good evening, everyone, and uh, greetings from, from Coventry, um, where I'm currently based. I hope that you're all uh, doing well, and thanks very much indeed for coming along to this talk. 
Um, I'd like to express my sincere thanks to, to Florian, to Ilka, uh, and to Hannah for the very kind inv invitation. Uh, I did and honoured uh, to be hosted by the new centre um, and look forward to its important work, which, as I'm sure you'll all has been made all the more pressing as a result of the uh, illegal, immoral invasion of Ukraine um, by the Russian state and the forced displacement of two million people and, and counting. Thanks also to Omar Barr um, for agreeing to act as discussion, uh, and I'm excited by the prospect of this evening's conversation. The um, presentation tonight is um, going to uh, in fact, two books, uh, two for the price of one. Uh, there's the vernacular uh, border security um, book, the sole authored book with the University Press that Florian uh, mentioned. I, I'm, I'm also going on some of the insights from another project um, that Florian mentioned, Reclaiming Migration, Voices from Europe's Migrant Crisis. And this was co-authored with uh, colleagues um, at Warwick, uh, Vicky Squire, Nina Pukowski, Dalal Stevens. Um, and what I want to do is to draw on, on both books to argue for a methodological shift in the study of border security in general, um, but also social, cultural and political, if you like, performance of Europe's so-called 2015 to 16 migration crisis in particular. One that um, combines, if you like, an analysis of elite governmental attempts to striate space to produce knowable and knowable subjects with grounded uh, studies of the everyday experiences of those populations in their own words. And in a very general sense, uh, this is what I mean by vernacular lens. Against the backdrop of uh, the performance of Europe's so-called migration this, relatively little is known about how European citizens and people arriving on the shores of Europe conceptualised, understood, talked about that crisis uh, and the impacts on lives. And yet, uh, to paraphrase the, the, the word of the uh, cultural security theorist Jutta Wells, if social and cultural meanings um, of Europe, of migration, of crisis, if, if those terms are all constructed subjectively and contested politically, then the knowledge uh, and the lived experience of ordinary people caught up in the events of 2015 to 16 were also really significant in shaping dominant framings of and responses to uh, elite crisis narratives. What I want to do is to draw on both of these books uh, in order to argue that while uh, elite and vernacular narratives are not mutually exclusive, and often we find the, the former uh, are reproduced in the latter, as I'll go on to talk a little bit about later, vernacular narratives have the capacity to, uh, to problematize, to disrupt uh, and or refuse elite crisis frames. And that's what I'm really interested in in exploring the potential for in this talk this evening. Because I think Europe's so-called 2015-16 migration crisis uh, looks radically different when we view it through a vernacular lens. The contingency of the crisis narrative is made much more visible, and so too, um, I will argue, are actually existing alternatives um, beyond that securitizing crisis frame. So my talk tonight is going to be structured in four main sections. The first section is going to briefly um, outline what I mean by this concept of vernacular that um, both books uh, are animated by. Uh, the second section is going to draw on uh, reclaiming migration to explore vernacular narratives of crisis and anti-crisis from the perspectives of people on the move seeking entry to the EU via the central Mediterranean route. Uh, the third section is going to present some of the key findings from uh, the vernacular border security um, book to present vernacular narratives of the same topic, but from the perspectives of the citizens that we 
interviewed across uh, the 11 uh, European cities. And then the final section will we'll reflect on where I'm heading with this project and some of the key, uh, key points. So let me begin by saying a little something about the vernacular approach that, that I'm um, adopting and arguing for. The OED defines vernacular quite simply as the language spoke, spoken by ordinary people in a particular country or region, end quote. Now, Houston uh, J. Baker um, characterizes vernacular studies as recovering what Foucault referred to as subjugated knowledge to analyze political cultures from subject positions that are often considered to be peripheral to dominant regimes of thought. And building on uh, Baker's seminal work, Thomas McLaughlin in his 1995, 96 book argued that, quote, those who lack cultural power can be thought of as vernacular theorists. Theory isn't just the domain of, of universities and so-called uh, experts, but actually is something that um, everyone can potentially uh, engage in. And while, as McLaughlin argues in his book, all vernacular theorists are ultimately uh, entrapped, if you like, within the symbolic orders that they seek to critique, this doesn't mean that the public are simply passive recipients of information from elite politicians or, or media sources. Rather, he argues that culture creates subjects, creates people who can discern the power of culture itself. And I think that's a really powerful um, argument and one that empowers people to think of themselves as theorists of uh, migration, borders, um, and international politics uh, at large. Inspired by some of those early insights in vernacular studies, but also I think it has to be said, building on the, the, the work of feminist and, and gender scholars um, who have worked for, for some time on, on the everyday, what we see in security studies at the moment is a real um, proliferation of interest in a research agenda that sought to investigate how ordinary people conceptualize and experience security and insecurity uh, in the context of their everyday lives and, if you like, in their own words, in the vernacular. And Lee Jarvis has been at the forefront of, of this work um, and he characterizes a vernacular approach to security as one that's grounded in the analysis of, quote, the seemingly ordinary, mundane, everyday, quotidian experiences uh, encountered and understood in the context of everyday life. And in this work, in the vernacular um, security literature, increasing attention is being paid to how diverse publics uh, construct and use uh, their own vocabularies, how they draw on their own um, cultural knowledge and categories of understanding, and how they express and reproduce notions of self-identity. And the thought here is that by investigating vernacular security speak, um, we are able to decenter the prevailing focus in security studies away from elite speech acts and think more carefully and assess the role of non-elite actors and their everyday conversations in producing cultures of security and insecurity. And while, as, as we see, uh, vernacular narratives spoken by ordinary people sometimes reproduce dominant political uh, logic and interests, what I want to draw out tonight is this idea that they are distinct because they have a capacity also to disrupt the established um, social and political order. So let me um, move quickly to apply some of these ideas, to bring them to life, and to try to illustrate what I think some of the implications of a vernacular approach might be for rethinking Europe's um, so-called 2015-16 migration crisis and why I think that's important both analytically and politically. And I'd like to begin by introducing uh, some of the work that we did um, 
underpinning the Reclaiming Migration uh, book. The Crossing the Mediterranean Sea by Boat project, uh, which was funded by the UK Economic and Social Research Council and led by my colleague, Professor Vicky Squire at the University of Warwick, um, and included a team that I was part of, sought to assess uh, the impact of uh, the EU Commission's policy interventions uh, in the period 2015-16 on people uh, who were seeking entry uh, to the EU by boat. This was a large-scale qualitative project and it involved in-depth face-to-face conversations with 257 people on the move at multiple sites across the Mediterranean region in that 2015 to 16 period. And it had two phases. The first phase, uh, which we completed by December 2015, um, focused on the island sites of Kos, uh, Malta and Sicily. And then phase two focused on uh, the urban sites of Athens, Berlin, uh, Istanbul, Istanbul and Rome. And we completed that um, during the course of 2016. The interviews that we held were, were semi-structured um, and the emphasis was very much placed on supporting participants to share their migratory stories, to explore how they made their decisions how they gained information and to draw out their experiences of uh, policy interventions. And my role in the project was to coordinate the field work in uh, Malta and Rome. In the book, um, we argue that the politics of crisis both legitimized a deterrent security uh, policy agenda, but it also silenced the voices and experiences of those migrating in precarious conditions as either victims uh, or perpetrators. And by focusing attention on the multiple ways through which people on the move contest these dominant narratives of crisis, we highlighted how those migrating speak and act in the name of equality where relations of inequality are otherwise presupposed. And I think that's really powerfully uh, demonstrated by this opening quotation here um, from a woman from Syria whom we interviewed in Kos, who said, what we want is our voice to be heard in the world. We just want our voice to be heard in the world. Vernacular narratives uh, reveal the various ways in which people on the move in this context at that point in time refused the dominant crisis frame and adopted what uh, Roitman calls an anti-crisis perspective. So I just want to unpack this idea of anti-crisis uh, as, a, as a key theme that we saw throughout the vernacular narratives of those whom we interviewed. First off, our research found that people on the move rarely describe themselves as being caught up in a migration crisis. Um, this was certainly not the framing of the situation that they could identify with. And, and I think that's illustrated um, by the second quotation here, um, from a man from Syria whom we interviewed in, in Athens. No one we interviewed uh, identified themselves or the people that they were traveling with as posing um, a, a security threat to European societies and economies. The vernacular testimonies pointed to the violence and threatening circumstances um, that people on the move found themselves in and actually turning the dominant narrative of crisis somewhat on its head. Uh, one woman from Cameroon interviewed in Rome said, it is because of insecurity in our countries that many um, are, are coming to Europe. Total insecurity, this is the phrase that she used, total insecurity is pushing us to migrate. I only want to live in security. I live in fear. Importantly, however, neither did um, interviewees uh, position themselves as uh, helpless victims, quote unquote, in need of saving, uh, as some humanitarian narratives of crisis also attempted to uh, position them as. So one man, a 41-year-old Syrian surgeon who we interviewed in Malta, provided a, a really harrowing account of his journey from Libya uh, to Valletta, during which he lost his, his family. Um, and actually the, the focus of his intervention was about 
not needing humanitarian aid, not needing humans, um, not needing uh, uh, humanitarian succor, but information. That was the key uh, demand that he uh, wanted to make. Vernacular narratives refuse several other really prominent features of that um, crisis frame. And I just want to pick out a few um, examples for you. So as, as I'm sure many on this call are aware, official uh, governmental narratives often portrayed those, particularly on the central Mediterranean route, as being primarily, quote, economic migrants. But our research highlighted their systematic exposure to diverse kinds of violence, and the inadequacy of that subject uh, positioning. The violence that people um, were fleeing from uh, was often of an overtly political nature, as uh, illustrated by this um, Somalian man whom we interviewed in um, Rome. There was also a high incidence of gendered violence, um, for example, threats of rape and genital mutilation. And so these factors, coupled with the absence of adequate protection and access to rights meant that our interviewees did not speak straightforwardly uh, of choosing to go to Europe as the dominant economic migrant frame uh, suggests. Rather, it was uh, typically more a case of needing to escape from a kaleidoscope of violence, conflict and persecution, what we call um, the intersecting drivers of flight in the book which cannot ultimately be divorced from the um, legacies of European colonialism. And I think, again, that's, that's very well illustrated by this quote from um, a, a man from Comoros Island. Deterrent uh, border security measures and anti-smuggling efforts associated with the European agenda on migration were, of course, central to governmental responses to the so-called crisis. And yet our research found that these uh, policies very often missed their mark. Prior knowledge about preventative border security uh, measures such as the military operations in the MED, uh, the hotspot approach and the threat of detention and deportation was scarce among our interviewees. People on the move uh, were not deterred from leaving because they had little knowledge uh, and awareness of, of stymie their journeys before they encountered apparatuses of deterrent security and policy interventions designed to disrupt uh, smuggling networks without opening up alternative safe and legal routes only served to stimulate more demand for smugglers services. In time anti-smuggling measures raised the costs and dangers associated with search for non-threatening ways of escaping violence uh, as illustrated by the words of um, uh, this uh, Kenyan man with whom we spoke in, in Malta. Um, lastly, um, uh, th th there was a, a very distinctive temporality, a uh, very distinctive um, take on the, on the time dimension of the crisis that we found in vernacular narratives. Whereas crisis can, constitutes uh, an urgent, um, short-term emergency frame, one of the most um, consistent vernacular narratives among people on the move was, was actually continuity rather than change, um, at least continuity and in their continued uh, exposure to violence and insecurity. So while uh, elite narratives of crisis drew a really sharp temporal border around the year 2015 as an exceptional period of excessive movement, those whose entire lives had been marked by post-colonial violence uh, spoke in much longer time frames. Rejected asylum seekers in Malta, for example, were effectively in a permanent state of limbo, with return to their country not being an option for many and with limited access to rights on the island. And this, um, I think, is illustrated by uh, the quote from, from the man from the Ivory Coast, um, who had actually been stranded in Malta for a decade when I, when I interviewed him. So drawing this section uh, together, I, I, I suppose I want to say that these vernacular insights really challenge dominant uh, Western temporal imaginaries of crisis that are associated with change, with uh, collapse and with discontinuity 
from a vernacular perspective of those um, seeking entry to Europe, uh, exposure to violence was not an aberration, but actually a function of ongoing uh, colonial relations. So having, um, having outlined the first project, I want now to um, say a little bit more about the uh, border security book, which draws on the um, underpinning research that Florian mentioned um, uh, entitled Border Narratives. So instead of speaking on behalf of citizens, which of course diverse elites sought to do in the context of the so-called migration crisis, the aim of this project was to create opportunities to listen to the issues, um, the anxieties and the demands of EU citizens in their own words. And we held 24 uh, in-depth focus group discussions with 179 EU citizens, uh, and they were varied uh, for diversity, not for generalizability, according to age, education, employment status, and geographical region. And we undertook this research in three phases across 11 cities that were differentially uh, implicated by uh, the so-called crisis. And you can see the three phases there from uh, November 2016 through to uh, November 2017. Discussions uh, in these focus groups were, were really rich, they were really in-depth, they were open-ended, and the way that we framed the questions was very much designed to um, avoid a, a crisis or a securitizing frame. Um, and what we wanted to do was to explore these, these questions, these central questions, how do diverse EU publics talk about migration and borders? What narratives do they use to express their everyday experience of these issues? Um, and what are the vernacular knowledges, concepts, categories, the racial and gender hierarchies, uh, the desires, the identity claims that are used in order to structure those vernacular narratives? And we also wanted to find out you know, to what extent are European citizens aware and supportive of government's policies designed to manage uh, migration and borders? And we also sought to find out, you know, what, what are some of the political claims and demands of those uh, citizens qua citizens? And, you know, as the book hopefully um, does better justice to than I can in this presentation, um, there's some really rich material that we uh, co-produced with our interviewees. So we had 40 hours of conversation time. Uh, we have uh, transcript materials amounting to more than 300,000 words. Inevitably, I'm not going to do justice to that now, but I want to pick out some of the key uh, recurring themes. While uh, there were very clearly different understandings at work of uh, border security within and across our groups, participants were invariably of the view that the EU had somehow lost control um, over its borders. And you, you can see um, some of those examples um, in the excerpts here from Amy Jane in Nottingham, from, from Philip in Munich, uh, Lali in, in Budapest, and Georg in Cologne. The Interdisciplinary literature, the academic uh, take on this is that, um, is that there is a kind of causal relationship between perceptions of the strength of borders at the macro level of the state and feelings of security at the micro level among citizens. This is what we find particularly in the literature um, on ontological security and in literature in um, political geography on um, psychosocial uh, perspectives on, on bordering. According to this work, transnational flows of people and sudden demographic change disrupt citizens' daily routines, dislocate their emotional attachment to particular places, and disturb notions of identity and belonging, which, when combined with uh, perceptions of socioeconomic injustice, gives rise to feelings of, of, of what many call ontological insecurity, this feeling of, 
of, of dread and the inability to manage exogenous um, forces. And in turn, um, the populist promise of what uh, Billig um, paradigmatically referred to as banal nationalism um, is that it restores a sense of sovereignty and the integrity of border security. And this is said to have widespread appeal because it offers, if you like, the comforting certainty or illusion of certainty uh, or ontological security in the face of all of this apparent change and disruption. The assumption in this literature is that tougher deterrent border security will lead to a reduction in the anxieties of uh, citizens. And if, if we apply this way of thinking to the so-called 2015 migration crisis, um, actually what we find is that the argument doesn't quite work um, because of course intensified efforts to police irregular uh, mobility that resulted in um, this frenzied uh, construction of border walls across Europe and of course the uh, concomitant uh, rise in, in, in deaths at sea should have restored a sense of ontological security uh, among EU citizens. But in the book, I argue that that's not, that's not what we saw uh, during, that, uh, during that period. And so that is the kind of central paradox, if you like, that the book tries to grapple with as a whole. Why is it that at the very time that we saw um, very visible construction of border walls, there was this populist uh, mantra of the need to take back control of our borders. That, that, re that tension really doesn't make uh, a great deal of sense. Um, so what resources do we have to, to think that through? In, in her brilliant book, um, Wall States Waning Sovereignty, um, Wendy Brown argues that instead of providing comforting certainty, uh, macro level bordering practices ultimately produce bunkered societies and political subjects that only desire more and more bordering. And she talks of this um, as a kind of perpetual cycle of ontological insecurity. And on her view, walls and bordering practices are actually reflective of uh, the diminution of state power and ability to control rather than their uh, projection. And she goes a step further to say that walls and bordering practices uh, proactively stimulate racism, nationalism and xenophobia anew. And so her concern in, in the book is that such practices encourage uh, uh, forms of border vigilantism among citizens uh, and combine to, if you like, make uh, securitization a way of life for us all. Now, we certainly saw um, evidence of those dynamics uh, in many of the focus group discussions. Um, in Miskolch, for example, um, we, we, we see uh, group discussions about the effectiveness of Orban's uh, fence building and in this exchange you can see the group talking about the need for um, a three or five meter tall barbed wire fence you know let's let's kind of outdo the fences in Spain and also in this exchange we see a good illustration of what Wendy Brown um, refers to as the masculine political fantasy of, of mastery associated with uh, uh, ideas of Hungary as um, if you like, uh, an impermeable sovereign space. I think Brown's argument is really interesting, particularly in the light of the paradox that the book tries to, that my book tries to grapple with, because it, it suggests that intensified deterrent border security and nationalist populist demands to, if you like, take back control of borders are not actually contradictory phenomena. But, but tautological dynamics that drive these obsessive border fantasies and desires for control. So I, I, I make, um, I draw a lot of inspiration from Wendy Brown's um, work in this regard. But while her psychoanalytical account is, is highly instructive, I go on in the book to suggest that actually it leaves 
ultimately little scope for contestation uh, of these bordering practices. And ultimately, it leaves little scope for, for change. And of course, this is problematic, not least because vernacular narratives of the migration crisis uh, that we encountered in the research program revealed uh, the widespread nature of those counter narratives. So as I'll go on to present, uh, we encountered lots of vernacular narratives about um, cultures of welcoming and hospitality, of living with strangers, and if you like, of refusals of the fantasy of borders uh, in Europe. And that's what I now want to uh, draw out as I, as I move my way towards um, a conclusion. Throughout um, focus group conversations, many EU citizens repeated familiar elements of the dominant uh, crisis frame. And many of those, as the book goes into in some detail, are highly gendered, they're highly uh, racialized. And so I don't want um, people attending uh, this talk to walk away with the, I am somehow romanticizing the vernacular as this innately progressive uh, realm. But I do want to argue that unlike the dominant elite crisis narratives, vernacular narratives um, were multifaceted and problematized the notion of a linear transmission, if you like, between elite narratives and the way that those moved and engaged among uh, diverse publics. As we found in the Crossing the Med project, many focus groups, in fact, most focus groups, did not spontaneously use the language of a migration, quote unquote, crisis facing Europe. In general, uh, there was widespread societal ignorance um, and confusion, frankly, about what was happening, uh, about where people were migrating from. And this is su summed up in, in the quote from Simon in Nottingham, I'm a bit confused about what it all means. This was very much the uh, refrain. And rather than a migration crisis, citizens um, spoke more commonly in terms of, if you like, a constellation of personal issues relating to e economic and social security, fears of losing welfare and employment opportunities, and perceived impacts of demographic change, identity, community, and place. Um, but I want to uh, focus on the uh, series of vernacular counter narratives, if you like, that actively sought to refuse the crisis frame. Because many of our interviewees recounted the effective atmospheres that flourished in 2015 across Central Europe. Uh, many told us that they had taken part in the day of protest on uh, the 12th of September in response to increasingly um, hardline approach. Some held in packed uh, football stadiums, declaring refugees welcome and kick racism out. And one group member um, even told us about clandestine networks that they were part of where citizens supported, um, if you like, illegalized mobility across the continent. These extracts from uh, Theresa, Mark and, and um, there was a very strong critique of the criminalization of mobility German groups. But across all groups, uh, many self-reflective vernacular narrative about participants' perceptions of their obligations to others. And I just want to draw this theme out a little bit more. The, the images Hurdy, um, the lifeless toddler who was washed up on a Turkish those images were a particular, uh, particularly powerful discussion and struck an emotional chord with many uh, participants. But those narratives, of course, run the risk of perpetuating notions of victimhood and thus recycling some of the dominant uh, crisis narratives and what Claudia Arado refers to as a politics of, of pity. Beyond um, those kind of narratives beyond uh, politics of pity. There were some really interesting vernacular narratives 
from our citizens that we interviewed. Um, for example, those who um, engaged in, in uh, critique, critiques of NATO, um, of uh, Western foreign policies, for creating the conditions of, policy, of uh, possibility for increased levels in deaths and deaths in the first place. Um, and we see those very well illustrated in the, in the quotations from Christian um, and, and Joe there. Um, others took that line of critique even further and sought to connect contemporary warfare, conflict and poverty and uh, population displacement with the legacies of European colonialism. And again, I think that theme um, is drawn out uh, by, these, by these quotations. I think that most of the problems have been created by us, Daniel, in uh, Cadiz. And, you know, lots of self-reflexive uh, commentary on uh, oppression uh, at the hands of um, past European generations. And I think this is interesting because whilst writers um, in the field of, of ignorance studies, notably the late Charles Mills, have drawn attention to the idea of, of white ignorance as a technology of, of power whereby white ways um, and uh, means of knowing have become hegemonic. You know, we, we, we certainly saw some of that white ignorance at play in our focus groups and you know, those themes are, are drawn out in the book, but we also see, and what I, what I was unexpectedly um, interested to, to find, were these van vernacular narratives that were very self-reflexive um, and aware of their own privilege. Um, so the vernacular counter narratives um, of Daniel and Melinda, for example, I think complicate um, this, the, the, that Europe fails to understand itself uh, in, in the context of colonialism and as post-colonial, to quote Gaminda Bambra. Beyond the divisive politics of crisis then, some interviewees sought alternative um, starting points for thinking about political community and relations among uh, strangers. Charlotte in Berlin, uh, for example, told us about how she wanted to support Europe beyond fleeting gestures at international railways. She talked about how she'd volunteered at a refugee centre. That had prompted her to want to get to know people um, arriving from Syria uh, a, a bit better. And she saw a Facebook post Syrians who were offering to do household jobs uh, whilst they the outcome of their asylum application. And, you know, many there is really powerful um, and speaks to the long and interesting relationships uh, that this period um, gave rise to. And, you know, Charlotte's story is, is one of many um, counter narratives that we, that we encountered that refused the for border security and the sovereign mastery over others. But I think these narratives have been subjugated by dominant crisis and the securitized response to increased arrivals and deaths. Narratives such as Charlotte's challenge the view that walling border and border security can only ever reproduce the desire for border security, as, as Brown um, argues. These illustrate actually existing desecuritized uh, to living with others in Europe today, which a vernacular approach is uh, uniquely placed to render visible. I'm just going to take two minutes um, to sum up some, some final thoughts. In conclusion, um, I want to suggest that the dominant migration crisis uh, implicated both people on the move and in its setting up of the problem of authorised, of unauthorised arrivals to the EU as, quote unquote, a threat to European societies, economies and public security. This very problematic crisis narrative has and continues to justify uh, a range of governmental policy interventions under the rubric of deterrent border security 
and serve to legitimise unprecedented levels of exposure to bombs on the move. And yet, despite being in the staging, in the performance of the crisis in this war, the voices and experiences of both people on the move and Europeans have largely been silenced in, in both public policy and academic. So a shift to the vernacular, I want to suggest, foregrounds diverse uh, voices of those dramatis personae in all their nuance and complexity. And for me, this holds promise for recovering widespread counter narratives beyond the dominant securitizing crisis frame. To be clear, I am not arguing that all vernacular narratives challenge or disrupt that dominant frame. This would be untenable in the light of the uh, highly gendered and racialized and xenophobic claims that were evident um, in our citizen focus groups in particular. But at the same time, vernacular conversations, unlike dominant elite narratives, are heterogeneous and they uncover everyday imaginaries that are not captured by the crisis frame. By recovering and juxtaposing these conversations, actually the distinction between people on the move and citizens that I've been running throughout this presentation um, is actually undermined, it's problematized, it's, uh, it's deconstructed. And so to embrace the vernacular is both, I would argue, a pressing political and an analytical task, unless we continue to succumb to the nationalist populist mantra that there is no alternative to crisis politics and to tougher deterrent border security in Europe today. Thanks very much for, for listening to my talk. Great, thanks a lot, Nick. Fascinating insights. I think we go straight to Omar to give his point of view on the subject. Please, Omar. Hello, do you hear me? Okay, perfect. Uh, thank you, Nick, for your comprehensive, uh, really interesting um, expose. Um, I think that you um, you have summarized, in fact, um, uh, <clears throat> everything uh, that we have been going through the last uh, 20 years in my lifetime of activities. <laughs> so uh, I recognize many, many, many things. So uh, it's fantastic. And it's great that you also, also that vernacular perspective, uh, it's really comes to the essential because I think that um, indeed um, uh, I will first start by saying that um, I, will, I will give you the name, uh, the so-called uh, migration crisis. Uh, I always call it an uh, institutional crisis. There was no mig there was never a migration crisis. There was a um, European institutions and especially European um, EU member countries who could not deal with that massive influx of migrants. So there was a crisis of policies, a lack of policies, uh, uh, an institutional crisis. Um, and uh, by calling it a migration crisis, in fact, they are just emphasizing what you are saying and contributing to that narrative, um, to feed that narrative, to feed the imaginaries uh, that will create that kind of uh, anxiety that, that will reinforce that anxiety, uh, that fear, and uh, especially the conversation, because I think that you had a, a super, a super um, position of different uh, issues, like uh, issues in that, in that context of uh, 2015, just to take that example, because you had different momentums where migration was an issue. Um, I remember, by example, people tend to forget uh, in 2004, um, uh, five, you had uh, uh, people migrating from uh, Western Africa, uh, dying at the shore of the Bahamas, uh, and uh, coming into Spain, by example. And we, we all saw those images. And there was a big conversation uh, about, OK, how to deal with this. The answer from the EU was uh, how to reinforce the borders, how to finance, uh, how to externalize borders, and how to contribute to finance uh, countries to hold uh, this migration. And again, that narrative of uh, migration being um, a problem, to problematize migration in it all, in itself. So uh, in the context of 2015, I think that uh, you had a superposition of different uh, issues. Uh, uh, first, um, 
uh, a vivid debate about dive, the, the diversity of societies, the demographic changes, uh, the rise of uh, far right movements uh, throughout the whole of Europe, uh, far right movement who have been feeding also the imaginary of uh, imaginaries of people during the last 30 years, by example, in, in Flanders or in Belgium, uh, specifically in Flanders, you had uh, one uh, far right party that was um, that for 40 years have been feeding the, the, the imaginaries and not only feeding the imaginaries of, uh, of the general population, but even contributing to change the lexicon, the political lexicon uh, about migration. Because today, if you, what people used to find shocking 30, uh, 30 years ago, uh, is now common language uh, in the political arena, not only in Belgium, by the way, but uh, I think in all, in all of Europe. And in France, you see the same conversation. And also in the same, in the same uh, uh, momentum, you had also this, uh, this post uh, 9-11 issue um, being, uh, uh, the fear of Islam, the fear of uh, Islamophobia uh, and general xenophobia going on. And, um, and this, uh, this uh, uh, silenced Afrophobia also uh, being uh, uh, Africa, the invasion, the possible invasion of Africans in Europe uh, and theories like uh, the great replacement uh, for population. So the superposition of all those different elements and then you have a crisis. Uh, then you have uh, this massive influx of uh, of people coming in, and the institutional crisis, the, the the which gives the feeling that we cannot deal with with this. We cannot deal with uh, the, uh, a so-called an invasion. Yeah? So and, and almost people used to deal with this issue as it was an invasion uh, that that went. Uh, that uh, that we are not prepared for, which confirms for some people and especially for some kind of movements and parties that uh, Europe cannot absorb it, Europe cannot deal with it, and demographically it will feel it it, it will be a problem. Uh, this being said, at the same time, at, at the same time, you had this issue of um, of. Uh, uh, how will I call it again? Um, people, um, I mean, uh, people being really solid, going to Calais, people giving closes, peeping, people going to border the borders with Greece and, and all of it, just to, uh, to show their solidarity. So you had this opposition of political, uh, political confusion, uh, people being uh, uh, the, um, uh, far right instrumentalizing uh, uh, this, this, this issue. And at the same time, also people showing a big uh, scale of solidarity, uh, in uh, in uh, which which uh, which was kind of unseen. So, uh, and it illustrates well your your study when you when you talk about there is not one one sided uh, when you talk about vernacular uh, narrative uh, as you as you have been uh, observing uh, during your your your. your your research, you see that you have different kind of perspectives. You have people going from the micro perspective and, uh, and mostly on the affect side and uh, expressing their feeling, uh, their confusion. And the problem also is that the only people, the only uh, movements who have been uh, giving simplistic answers to this anxiety were populist movements for the most of it. Eh? And most of, most of the most of the most established political parties were in the defensive. At the same time, they were in the defensive, uh, uh, banalizing this, this anxiety and even stigmatizing this anxiety and not giving answers and sometimes even confirming mm, uh, without, uh, uh, not by purpose, but confirming, if in fact these populist, uh, these populist simplistic answers, because they don't, they didn't have any uh, uh, answer of alternatives, and which made it real difficult also for us as a civil society mostly to uh, to get into this conversation and uh, to bring human rights uh, and the necessity and to respect human rights. And another issue also that I want to uh, that I want to bring on the table is the confusion that is being made between. Uh, migration and asylum, which are two different things. And mostly in the narrative, we talk about migration on, the, on, on that issue. And the conversation about, okay, 
Britain um, and, and most of the European country do not have a migration policies, I'm sorry. They deal with migration, they have, uh, they have a set of laws about migration, about how to be settled here, how, but they don't have a proactive migration policies. They have, and the asylum uh, uh, concerning asylum um, is, it is um, um, they are just trying to respect those conventions, sometimes question those conventions, the Dublin uh, Accord and so on and so on. So, but re a real migration policy, there is none. There is none of it. No, there is not a, an European country that can uh, display here. I have a vision about migration on how to deal with it, on how to um, and how how to prepare to, uh, to to more migration or to organize that migration and so on and so. On. So it's interesting to see. For me, uh, when talking about um, uh, the the language of the elite and uh, the vernacular, I think it's important to say that uh, confusion is first uh, in the elites, the political elites, the establishment. Uh, and we have a really problematic, uh, the elites have a really problematic way to deal with this with this question. And most of, and, and, and which and why uh, mostly they have that problematic uh, issue of, of dealing with that question is because firstly, any political uh, movement or organization of uh, is uh, um, uh, puts his strategy on how to to have uh, uh, acceptance of public opinion. So, without giving a, a rightful proposition, what they do now, they serve on the emotion and the affect of uh, the public opinion, which kind of bring more confusion and more anxiety. And 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 this and and in Britain with the Brexit and uh, and uh, in different European countries we see the same. And it's not a surprise if you see that in the last European elections, for the first time you uh, you had so much uh, uh, far right or conservative, extremely conservative uh, political party, which of uh, and all of them, they acceded to to, to those to, to the European Parliament thanks to the issue of migration, of migration, hmm? on how they propose on migration, on how they they intend to reinforce uh, an anti-migration policy, on how it is needed to stop migration, on how also they they need to reduce the demographics, on how they need to protect European values and identity and so on and never since these last five years you have an amalgam that is being made between migration european identity uh, the place of religion in the public spaces and so on and so on and so on so it's not a surprise that people are confused it's not a surprise that the ordinary people are confused because the political arena is even more confused than the people <laughs> And then, and, and, and this is kind of, and, and so it's, uh, your study is really interesting. And I hope that your study gets, gets, gets a, a wider audience uh, and, uh, and that, that this conversation also uh, will be a conversation that, we, that people will have in the European parliaments in, uh, in, in I mean, uh, and the national political elites will, 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 will have insights on it just to have, this has to be a public conversation because it's important to say so. And some, something else I want to say is uh, that uh, the anxiety and the confusion that, uh, uh, that people have is sometimes misunderstood because sometimes it's straightfully uh, stigmatized. And when you stigmatize uh, uh, people who are confused, they seek for comfort and pity enough, uh, the people who offer them comfort are mostly the, the, the political parties that you don't want to deal with. And those are populist, those are, are far right movements and so on and so on. Um, and it's, it's interesting also because I, I saw a question, one question here, uh, because now we find ourselves, this last, uh, this last six years, we find ourselves in really specific times and, and you in your introduction also you said it, I hope that uh, that uh, peace will prevail. I hope that uh, that um, that uh, Ukrainian people uh, will not have to 
to to make more sacrifice than they already do. Huh? That people will uh, that 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 kids, uh, uh, men and women and, and some others will uh, will come together as families and be able to live as families. So uh, this needs to be said. Um, uh, and but uh, the issue of the last weeks uh, says a lot also. In, in some and it's a consequence also of this all this conversation that we've been having this last 10 15 years on migration on this diverse society on inclusion on the Russell racialized uh, conversation that we are having on the gender issue and so on and so on so what do we have right now uh, you had for example last week uh, interesting comments from a uh, diverse journalist from the US us uh, from European um, uh, outlets and, and, and groups who said, uh, by example, that uh, the enthusiasm to receive uh, Ukrainian refugees is uh, it can be justified because, uh, first of all, uh, they are people like us. So this, these are the terms used. Right? It's not, it's not, it's not a language from a far right group, but uh, from 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 regular journalists and uh, from regular com commentators. So people like us, and um, they uh, they are culturally like us. They are more civilized. I'm using words that I just hear. Huh? I'm not I'm not uh, putting the words. And uh, they drive they drive our cars. They work like we do. Uh, they are civilized. They are not those people from Iraq and those people from Syria. So we heard all those. All of this we we heard, and we heard also that religiously they are more close to us, so they are they will be assimilating more easily. So uh, I think that this is revealing. Also, this is revealing, uh, and this this are uh, this have been said uh, by 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 the elites, I would say. Um, and so when you have this language being diffused uh, on people, uh, one week uh, in 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 an in a momentum of, of big emotions, of big fears, what do you expect people, ordinary people to have as reflection? They will just, they will just be ventriloquists of this kind of narrative. And then you hear this narrative by ordinary people saying the same, because mostly uh, people are just repeating what they're hearing in the media and what they're hearing from some political movements they are following or for people they rely on to have an opinion that they take for uh, the right opinion. So we are, I think that the, the so the, for me, the vernacular, uh, uh, for me, the, the language of uh, ordinary people cannot be, uh, uh, has to be uh, connected also with uh, the narrative used by political elites and the media and uh, major commentators, because they are the influences. They are diffusing some words, because there are some words. I think that I, I want I want to ask you that question also. Uh, I'm sure that there are some words that you have been hearing all along by different uh, with different people using the same word of the same even sentence. And I'm sure that those sentences, if you trace back those sentences, you will find them uh, that somebody, one politician has been saying them or one commentator has been saying them. So, so I think it's important to to, to be. To be aware of, uh, to, uh, to, put, to be aware of this, and to put this in the in, in the conversation. Um, and I think that uh, that uh, for me, uh, uh, is is always interesting to see that when even a solution is is proposed. By example, the Global Pact on Migration that has been proposed as a uh, as a frame, uh, um, a legal frame. Uh, uh, a frame where people can, could reflect on the global level on the question of migration. Uh, that those people who pretend to, uh, to, uh, to to find local solutions to it, hmm? that those are the people who reject those, <laughs> this kind of frame. And in Belgium, even we went so far that we even lost our government because of this <laughs> because of this conversation. Because uh, uh, we, we lost we, we lost our the government resigned because of. Because of the global pact on migration, and well, uh, I don't want to interrupt you, but can you slowly round up? Because I see that the questions are already coming in, in the Q and A session. Okay, okay. So I'm just, I'm, I'm just trying to, to I, I will round up right now. So for me, I think it's important uh, that, that that is really, uh, is, is good. It, it it helps us to to have more insights and to see to develop new strategies uh, on how to 
have a new conversation on these issues uh, and also to, uh, to be more pedagogical in our approaches uh, and uh, not and if we want to be to bring change of course we have to have a new narrative of course we need a new narrative that that broaden the scope of people that help people to understand what is going on and not to make the amalgams we should not repeat the amalgams we should not be in the defensive and we should be proactive in explaining uh in explaining the anxiety the truth of anxiety because those anxiety are not only european those anxiety you can find them in other places in the globe but uh also to explain and to, to, to be more pedagogical about why is it, it, it is happening, uh, which are the push factors that brings people to, to move, uh, which are the causes of that, the economical causes, the political causes, which are related also to, uh, to decisions and political positions in the EU itself. And you, 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 you just said it about colonization, not only about colonization, but about um, uh, business relations, about, uh, uh, about how you do business with people of the uh, or countries of the south and and which accords are you which treaties are you putting uh, on place that are disadvantaging people in the south making them poorer so they don't have any choices then to move and to to, to search for for other perspective or supporting dictators in some countries supporting some dictators uh, that, that are oppressing people when you do that it's not a surprise that people are moved. Explain it to people. And I think that the media has a big role to play. To, to, to play. I think that academies, uh, academia has, has could play a big role by, by, uh, by vulgarizing some, some terms and, and, and some researchers to explain to people also and uh, have more collaboration between civil societies and uh, academia to, uh, to diffuse uh, some uh, insights, messages, and to help build a new narrative, a narrative that can help people to have a better conversation. Because until now, there is more monologues uh, beside each other, but not the real conversations. Great, thanks a lot, Omar. Uh, Nick, would you like to react very briefly? And then I hand over to Hannah, who will take over with the Q&A session then. Well, um, let me begin by thanking Omar for, for that fantastic, um response and you know I, I i wholeheartedly agree with the thrust of your argument there at the end um about the need for what actually i call in the book kind of creative coalitions uh across civil society um and uh academia uh in order to try to first of all highlight the problems and the limitations of that of terms in which the conversation tends to take place and then secondly to uh, sketch out some of the uh, new terms on which uh, future conversations may develop but I suppose rather than as an academic uh, setting those terms what, what I'm trying to do in these books is to draw inspiration from people who themselves are uh, either seeking um, escape from highly precarious violent conditions and uh, refuge and hospitality in Europe, but also um, citizens in whose name uh, efforts are then uh, taken and legitimized to, to stymie those, those, those people seeking that, uh, seeking that justice. So I, I really welcome that intervention and that's why I'm so excited to have this conversation this evening and um, you know, I'm sure that many of the points that you've uh, highlighted around um, politics of fear, around politics of um, populism and the far right and, and their attempts to stoke that fear through uh, the use of highly simplistic um, slogans to address very, very complex socioeconomic challenges um, will, will come out. And um, perhaps I can respond to a number of, of those points in a bit more detail in conversation with other um, part of this call. Okay, thank you. Thank you, uh, both uh, speakers. Thank you, Nick, for this very rich, uh, interesting lecture with, uh, I must say, also a very innovative uh, 
research and thank you Omar as well for your um, interesting reflections and, and points of discussion. As we agreed, we will stop the recording now as we start uh, the Q&A session. Um, I see some questions have come in.